This is Scarlet Rogue here, coming at you with my first hero gameplay guide. I've been a Paragon player since Alpha stage, and I dipped into MOBAs at first with Smite, which wasn't very long ago, but I, uh, I really immersed myself into this genre, and I, I really became intrigued with the amount of tactical gameplay and team play required to pull off wins. So, um, I became really familiar with it, and what I'm bringing you today is a guide to Severog and I'm going to be going through and demonstrating and talking about uh, some of the basic methods with him as well as some of the more advanced gameplay and tactics uh, but I'm also going to be bringing you my personal favorite build and uh, so I'm going to dive right in here uh, into Sensei Rog. Now, I'm just showing you what I believe is the best way to play Severog. Um, I believe he's best used as a support tank in lane, but this is of course just my personal preference. Uh, it doesn't mean I don't dip, dip into the jungle, I've seen a lot of Severog guides, it doesn't have to agree with everyone, this is just my experience. Severog is my main, and uh, I have really good uh, record with him. I love playing with uh, teammates with him. He's, he's, he's my favorite kit and uh, our main goals as Severog isn't kills and doing damage. It's actually just supporting damage units and allies, um, staying alive, keeping our lanes, being on the front line, making sure that we get ahead and that they stay behind, okay? Letting our teammates go back, upgrade, making sure our towers are healthy and pushed. Um, this is what we do, and Severog's kit is really, really useful when used correctly. He can defend towers, he can isolate targets, um, he can lock down almost anyone he wants to, and he's got a really, really unique kit, especially for a tank, and he's just really good at disrupting uh, enemy players. So, uh, let's get into it. This is the build. Uh, with Prime Card, we're going to start with Centurion, um, because the amount of armor we're going to be building on Severog, the more health we have, the more effective we're going to be in combat, especially those late game team fights. And in some instances, we can just straight up tank the core, okay? So um, we have this lot of tokens. We have one barrier token, one guard token, one shaman strength, one strike token, because that's all I have, but that's all we need for a tank, and a healer token to fill in that odd number gap with some of the cards we have because they are at odds with the CXP system in, love, in terms of leveling up. I have a Beastmaster's key, just in case uh, no one on our team actually wants to jungle. I will get this key and hit Harvesters right at the 3 minute mark. Uh, I won't always hit camps until I get some damage on my build, and uh, until they at least hit level 3 or else I just don't feel they're worth my time. So I, more often than not, we have lots of junglers in the Paragon community, so my first item that I get is Circle of Health. It gives us mana right away. It gives us sustainability. We can stay in our lane. Uh, I always support our ADC carry, whatever lane he's in. Um, I stay with him. I make sure he stays alive. I like to stay on top of the enemy carry if I'm often laning with, against them. And, uh, you know, I like to stay on top of the enemy and keep them, you know, behind, as I said. I play really aggressive knowing that I have health regen as it's most effective early game or health pools, you know, never lower. So the health regen is just really useful that early game. It's great for death balls in the jungle. You're going to win out. So it's a great first card. It's, it's, it's definitely a force to be reckoned with. Scourging Tales is just a quick, sorry, it's not a quick six, but it's a six point uh, optional end game card that I have just in case the enemy team is building tons of armor and I feel like our team has lots of damage but I seldom get this in most cases. Um, now this deck doesn't really have a particular order that I use, it's completely circumstantial guys. I use whatever I feel is going to accommodate me in every situation because every circumstance is different in almost every game. I will sort of explain some of the numbers as best as I can. So. Um, after Circle of Health, believe it or not, one of my first cards that I get is Matt's Force Sash. So I, I stay in lane till I get six points. My teammate is back, he's upgraded. I go back, I'm probably out of mana. I get Matt's Force Sash. 
uh, I use that extra point. I usually get barrier token if there's a healthy mix of uh, three and two in terms of energy damage and physical damage on the enemy team. But that doesn't always happen if it's lopsided with physical, let's say, and there's only one real threat of energy damage, and let's say we're not even laning with him. I'll get the Shaman Strength right away. So that'll help us with our mana. But after that, I will get the Brawler's Ward, typically, and upgrade that for a quick six point upgrade because this gives us all the mana we'll ever need you guys uh if we have efficient handling of our mana and and we're you know we're landing subjugate and we're last hitting minions with our siphon you know not always one we're trying to hit two minions three minions when we can uh, you know that's all we're ever going to need especially with mad sport stash Mad Sport Sash is going to help us stack minions, guys. If you p position yourself correctly, it's going to wear their health down. You hit them, and you're stacking quickly early game. It's also great for other reasons, like uh, it nullifies Iggy's turrets right away. You stay on top of his turrets, suddenly Iggy can't lane. You're out laning Iggy because of Mad Sport Sash, okay? Now, I I'll once I get that, I usually leave it alone and go upgrade my Brawler's Ward and I have a Shaman's Drink and everything's dandy. But some games go sideways and they have four physical damage heroes. It does happen, especially li lately with Countess being in almost three quarters of the games, it seems. I'll get another six points and I'll get Alpha Guard right away. And what this does, guys, is it totally lopsides the enemy team because they're going to be expecting you to do damage to you and they won't be able to. Even with your low amount of health, your health regen is still going to keep you alive a lot of the time. And and that doesn't matter because you're just the focus for damage. They're going to want to hit you and smack you and you're going to have your allies who are actually building cards and damage, which is more soft than your carry, which is why I stick with them. So this is our job to be in their face and I'll often do that. So I'll get the alpha guard right away. But a lot of times we don't and it's a healthy balance on the enemy team. So continuing on, <clears throat> uh, if they do have a fair amount of energy damage, let's say three heroes or more, especially four heroes, I'll get this tuned barrier with a quick six point upgrade because we need those stats early. This will also help you against enemy heroes like Gideon and Iggy from Iggy's turrets. Uh, hopefully you have the minor barriers, if not you can just use lesser health because the more health we have with circulate health early, it's going to be deadly. Don't forget we're also healing from Mad Spore Sash. Um, so I will typically leave that alone once it's upgraded and uh, then I will go get Tempered Plate and that'll give us even more uh, defense, physical armor and health because if we haven't upgraded mad sport stash if we have i'll tend to <clears throat> just uh discard this tuned barrier um usually after i get swift creek card but sometimes before and i'll get thorn green wave and we'll max that out for damage and resistance now after that we'll typically get swift creek heart this is a simple nine point upgrade you get six points to get swift creek heart Throw on a lesser health and a minor kinetic. Minor connects all you really need, guys, with Severog, especially with Mad Sport Sash. I see a lot of builds out there running sometimes two like major kinetics, and I've run that too. And yeah, it's useful, but the reality is, is um, you're just not going to be putting out as much damage. And trust me, with just the 11 upgrade and attack speed, bit with your basic scaling and attack speed that every hero has anyway. You're going to end up around 142, 140 anyway. And with Mad Sport Sash, as I mentioned earlier, you're going to be able to still get those stacks. So this is the majority where our health comes from. We do get a little bit of uh, from Tempered Plate, and we have Temper uh, Tomb Barrier on. But we give that up late game, and that's fine, because we have a lot more health by then, because we've grown in stacks, hopefully. Now, I skipped Bane Flesh because this is sort of a last... Uh, one of the six point optional cards. This is a circumstantial card. I use it strictly in matches against uh, usually a Chimera that gets ahead and he's very dangerous or a Rampage that does the same thing and he's tower diving and uh, or sometimes I've had matches where they're both on guys and it's there isn't a, a more effective card against those two enemy heroes simply because they rely on their ability to heal. A lot of people forget that uh, 
you know, bleeding and poison has additional effects other than just health. Well, poison nerfs your attack and, sorry, bleeding nerfs your attack and poison nerfs your healing. We think of Blight Bones in this regard, but this was true for Poison before such a card came out. Poison reduces healing, and nothing's funnier than watching a Chimera who wants to start hitting you right away to build his passive, or a Rampage who's low on health and activates, he pops his ultimate, and he's expecting to heal, and he doesn't, and he's totally screwed. So, it's a really useful card. I Obviously, I put... Uh, health on it because running critical uh, strike chance on Severog is just ridiculous, especially on this build where there's just not a whole lot of damage. And um, I would typically just throw another uh, lesser health on Swift Creek Part 2, but the, as I said, Kinetic is a little bit nice, and I only have three lesser health, and I decided to put two of them on Bane Flesh. So I went with what I have, and it still works out really well. The 100 health doesn't really make that much of a difference in the end and the kinetic is nice so there's the full build you guys and as i said it's completely circumstantial we use these tokens to get to our odd values like five and four you know we can discard one or two at any point when we have three cxp but most of the upgrades are uh based on six cxp visits simply because of our sustainability there are games where i have a healer token mats for sash circlet of mana at 12 cxp and that's you know a rare occurrence but th that's what i do when um our team is just stacked with damage i just get a lot of healing a lot of defense i'll get the gardens the garden barrier tokens next and i'll get my brawler's ward and i'll just discard them as i go now um i'm gonna be showing you some gameplay footage i hope you guys enjoy watching and just hopefully you can take what you find useful from it and uh yeah i will uh Get going on that. Thanks for watching. Severog Advanced Tactics. It's important to know your role as a support tank, and when playing Severog, whether you have armor or health regen, the biggest thing is to stay near your teammates, whether it's early, mid, or late game, jungle, or in lane, just stick with your teammates, be there for the fight, and you'll most likely come out on top. Being patient early, but aggressive. You don't always need to ex overextend like this Grim here, or land all your abilities. As you can see, I just get behind him, bop him into my tower. Tower doesn't even target him, and I manage to finish him off before he can ultimate me. Early game support and disrupting enemies. As I said earlier, I like to stay on top of the enemy team carry. I'm doing a bit of damage here with an upgraded Brawler's Ward. And that's all I really need to do, and I manage to land a Soul Stack Siphon. I slow both of them down for my Feng Mao to catch up, and I manage to Root Steel before he can use his charge and keep him in range for Feng Mao's ultimate Earth Shatter, and I'm even rewarded for the kill. Now, there's a bit left over with this video I didn't trim, so I'm going to take some time to talk about Severog's soul stacks okay i throw a few wards down here on my way back by the way because we want to monitor this lane after we just push it a little bit because it's it's it's, it's a healthy stage right now now severog soul stacks comes down just to last hitting minions you last hit minions with square it's as simple as that if you can't last hit minions in a moba you need to do a little bit of work and practice but hey it comes with experience and we all get used to it and that's all you really need to know we you know with match for stash especially we can whittle down multiple minions health and that by that point we can siphon two or three minions at a time which is what we should be doing all game baiting enemies is really really easy to do guys you want to get in their face and have them chase you uh, this Quan gets a little aggressive I lead him back to my tower I subjugate him I bump him in, he gets body blocked by minions and me, and it's an easy kill. Basic tower method. This is the bread and butter of Severog's defensive strategy, okay? There's two ways you can do it, and I'm going to show you both. I chose this clip because I am low on health, and I want to show you it can be done at any point. Now, I land a subjugate here on Iggy because I need to make sure I can get him in my tower, and as you can see, I barely do, but he's just in range of my ultimate and bump him into my tower. He gets bumped in a little bit more with how it's your support and we secure the kill. Now that's landing subjugate on the enemy first when I need to make sure I can get to him. This next one will demonstrate when we know we can get behind the enemy, 
we should take that advantage every time. So this Faye has low mobility, she gets a little bit too close and overextends, I get right behind her with Phantom Rush, I bump her into our tower with my ultimate, she popped hers, I land Subjugate on her to keep her under my tower, a little bit of body blocking, and my Mad Spore Sash takes her out. Here's another method, I believe it was in the same game, this poor Faye, I get behind her with Phantom Rush, boom, in my tower, land Subjugate, she's stuck there, ultimate for Murdoch, and we secure the kill once again with Mad Spore Sash. Now this is a more uncommon tower method when we're actually on the offense. This Richter is low in health and so am I so I decide to get him out of the tower and secure this kill because I have an interest in leaving as well. But it's something you can do. Uh, ultimate timing. This is huge. Uh, as you can see I'm full build here and Feng Mao probably is too and in retrospect I don't think I should have started this engagement but I've read in black buff and I know how it serves on his way. So I lead him back to my minions a little bit. I position myself on the side and activate my ultimate so I get all of his minions are out of the question now. And unfortunately he teleports away from my minions a little bit but that's okay because we've taken his health down a little bit with a colossal blow and we finish him off especially with support from our teammates. Here's another ultimate timing and a combo, it's a classic by the way, where we actually bump Iggy back into a Gideon's black hole. And although he doesn't get in the tower right away or at all, rather it's fine because we do secure the kill quite easily. And I believe this is a fan favorite. Isolating and rooting enemies. Now, this howitzer has just been a thorn in my side, so I decide I want him dead and you gotta play Severog like that. So you gotta isolate him back into your damage dealer. Feng Mao takes him out, Howitzer tries to get away, but I just stay on top of him, especially with the Sash doing damage. Steel gets me away, but that's okay, because Feng Mao catches up, and now Steel's Very trying nice. to get away, but all I need to do is keep him near my damage dealer. Like previously, earlier, with Murdoch and Steel, I was low health, and Feng Mao was just raking into them, so that's all we need to do. And the clip's a little short, and I'm sorry about that, guys, but I... I guess I didn't record it. Now this is what I call a drop gank, and it's exploiting the visibility of tunnel vision right here. There's a little bit of elevation in Paragon, so we take advantage of this tunnel vision Murdoch, we bump him into the tower, it's an easy kill even without teammates. And I'm going to show you another example of a drop gank right here. This one's a little bit different because I think this Murdoch is a little bit smarter, but we land Subjugate on him, boom, knock him into our damage dealers. And although we're not trying to get the kill, we are getting rewarded here, it seems, and we land the Siphon. Uh, predicting movement and rooting. This takes a little bit of experience, guys. Sparrow activates her ultimate, and I can anticipate where Feng Mao wants to go because he wants to get away from me. Muriel drops in to help me, which is really nice. I managed to root, or, sorry, root uh, Feng Mao for the kill, and Muriel, just, he gets a kill out of it as well. Tanking damage and protecting allies. So here we have a Greystone that dies, pops his ultimate, Muriel comes to protect him, they get a double pop up which is really nice, I finish their ADC, uh, Greystone's in trouble so I root two of them and I knock them away, I get in Richter's face and now they're hurting guys, I'm all up in their face, this is what tanks are supposed to do, there's a little bit of potential kill here but I decide not to chase and just tell my teammates to retreat because I did my job as a tank, and we do, we retreat safely. Now here's a bit of a more spread out clip, but I, I wanted to include it because it shows you guys the versatility that Severog can have and and just basically how to be the focus in, in team fights. And I'm not even full build here guys, I'm only at 36 CXP and I don't normally take two shaman's drinks, but I mean hey, here we are, right? Uh, this Kwong has been worn down by our team, uh, our allies, um, Murdoch and Gideon and I land a travel mode subjugate which is always nice and I get up close finish him with siphon which is again a nice little treat and never gets old and I go back to my teammates mid lane to surprise by Feng Mao and I decide to bop him away because he gets right on top of our carry. I try to land the subjugate on him but there's a chimera and decides to pull our Murdoch behind me and while I'm having trouble choosing who to defend I notice that Gideon finishes Feng Mao off, chimera is on Gideon he is no getaway, so I decided to get in Chimera's face a little bit. We do have Mad Sports Sash at this point. Gideon stays in the fight, he drops a meter on, which really helps. Thanks, Gideon. And we want to keep Chimera near us because he thinks he can take us at this point, but he's not doing damage. So I'm just going to surprise him with a little bit of a death here. 
And now we're in a bit of trouble because Howitzer's just been laying into us, but that's okay. So we're gonna bait him into the jungle here, and Bellica's gonna come with us as well. So I don't use my Phantom Rush, and we get a nice gank by Grux here. I pops his ult. We get to kill Bellica. I Phantom Rush out of Howitzer's ultimate here. He uses his missile to do a little sidestep. Gideon's in the fight still because he's such a great teammate this match, and we get to finish off Howitzer. So that's what the team gets for being greedy. And look guys, we, we have under 300 health. This is how you're supposed to play. Tanks are supposed to die, all right? It, it shouldn't be a huge consequence. This is how you help your teammates win. As, as we said earlier, we, we keep our teammates alive, our lanes healthy. This is how we get ahead, keep the enemy team behind. Being the focus is massive. Now, uh, here is a full build team fight late game. It's not really as, you know, impressive as some of, you know, other team fights I've been in or seen or included, probably. But I just wanted to include it because it shows how we can use our abilities to keep our teammates alive. In this case, I'm tries laying in our Sparrow, but we managed to get him. And I went after him because he was the only damage dealer next to Grimix. And as we can see, Murdoch, Grimix, and Kwong chasing this low health Sparrow here. I managed to land a Subjugate on this Murdoch. I try to kill him with my ultimate, but I miscalculate, which is fine, because we smack him midair for a funny kill there. Um, I actually wasn't aware these two were behind me, so I, I, I finish off Kwong here. And before I can even do that, Sparrow totally grims at Sparrow's mercy behind me. And that'll be the end of that. And I'm, here's a little clip about tanking the core late game. Uh, I have all four buffs here. You know, black buff, and with OP is all you really need, and I take that chance every time I... I have it in the game with the inhibitor down, but as you can see there's two enemy heroes, tons of minions, and they were just doing no damage at all guys. So here's a little bit of a of an end game clip with my modern full build. Um, it's a little bit louder, so I hope you guys will enjoy everything that I uh, hopefully shared with you and the knowledge that I've gained through a lot of Severog gameplay. and. Uh, Stick around to the end of the video for a few more announcements, and I hope you guys enjoyed. Thanks. And that's my Severog gameplay guys. Guys, I hope you enjoyed and took what you could from it. I hope it's useful. Uh, thanks for watching. If you thought this guide helped you, please share and like to spread the info so Severog can rise again. Stay tuned for Kalari Encounters Hero Guides.